So the, the first half of the video was just kind of talking about the unit circle, the T values, reference numbers, that kind of stuff. Uh, how to generate those. So it would have been a little bit of a review of, of Thursday and Friday last week. Uh, but then about halfway through, we start talking about this. Okay, And, and I want to talk about why this is true and why this makes, should make sense to us. Uh, and, and then ultimately, hopefully, that bridges the gap or, or creates an understanding for you of the purpose of the unit circle. Okay, uh, Because of its, essentially the reason is it, it's convenient. Okay, It's more convenient than working with a... Uh, radius of 2 or 10 or 20, but if we did work with those radiuses of 2, 10, or 20, we would still generate the same information. It's just that the ordered pairs on those are probably a little bit harder to deal with, harder to develop. Okay? Um, so what I want to talk about is the fact that when we're in trigonometry, essentially, obviously we're talking about these angles and the unit circle and that kind of stuff, but trigonometry by you know, breaking down that Greek word, tri, meaning three, right? Gon, meaning angle, okay? And then metry, meaning measurement, right? So we're talking about measurements of triangles, trying to work with triangles, figure out their relationship. So the unit circle allows us to do that. So if we have a triangle that has a 30-degree angle in it, okay? Why does the unit circle help me? with sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, and their inverses as well, why does the unit circle help me when maybe my triangle doesn't have a hypotenuse of 1? Maybe my triangle has lengths of uh, 3, 4, and 5, or something like that. Why do I still have the ability to use sine, cosine, and tangent from the unit circle? And this is, this is the logic behind that. You know that And when I say you know, that might be an assumption that, that I'm making because you were in my geometry class. But we should understand that this blue triangle and this red triangle are different, right? They're different sizes. But they're the same type of shape, right? And when we talk about same type of shape, the, I, I'm not just saying triangle or triangle. I'm saying a triangle in which they both have... that angle right there, they both have a right angle, correct? And they both have that angle right there, correct? And they're congruent, right? And there's a lot of reasons why these are congruent. Obviously, um, the way I constructed this, I forced from A down to the x-axis, I forced that altitude to be perpendicular to the x-axis there and over here. So, by construction, those are both right angles. By incorporating this angle here, we have the reflexive property. Angle B is in both triangles, right? That's enough to say these two triangles are similar to one another. So we could also have looked at that angle there and that angle there because these two lines are both vertical or both perpendicular to the x-axis. Then these two angles that I highlighted up here are corresponding, right? With parallel lines, corresponding angles are congruent. So we have what we call it in geometry, angle-angle similarity, meaning that these two things are the same shape, corresponding angle, but all three sets of corresponding angles are congruent, and or, or that then is a postulate that, that guarantees similarity, and with similarity, we get the idea that side lengths should be proportional. Does that make sense? Meaning that the largest side should compare to the largest side in a fraction, just like the small side compares to the small side in a fraction. Does that make sense? Which would equate to then the middle side comparing to the middle side. Now, in order to find, it's easy to find the largest side compared to the largest side. The largest side compared to the largest side in those two triangles both got to be the hypotenuse compared to the hypotenuse, right? Now, depending on the triangle, finding the small side uh, and the middle side might be uh, a little bit harder to deal with. So let's, let's just do this. This is what we did back in uh, geometry. We named the blue triangle. Let's say that we named the blue triangle um, ABC. doesn't matter. Triangle ABC. 
That is then similar to the red triangle, which now I just got to make sure that the angle A, which is that one right there, matches up to the angle that it was congruent to in the red one, right? So that was D. So A and D have to be the first letters. Okay. B down here in the blue triangle, is that the same angle in the red one? Okay, so they need to match up. And then C was the right angle in the blue one, so it's needed, it needs to match up to the right angle in the red one, so I get that. So we write that similarity statement. And then the sides that are proportional, once I write that uh, similarity statement, it's very simple to see that AB compared to DB should match up. AB, is that a hypotenuse of the blue? DB, is that a hypotenuse of the red? Okay, that should equate to, should have two other ratios here, should go to BC, which is just these last two letters, and BE, those last two letters. Now, I don't know, but actually I do, uh, but the BC ends up being the middle side of the blue triangle, and BE ends up being the middle side of the red triangle. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, you don't need to know that they're in the middle, but you do need to know from this that they, they correspond. They match up. And then the last one says AC, first and last letter, should correspond to DE, first and last letter. Okay? Then that, uh, we call that an extended proportion. We should be able to take out any two of those ratios and compare any two of them. I want to compare, just for the sake of um, this explanation, I want to deal with the hypotenuses. So I'm going to use that first ratio. And then I don't really care the second one. Okay, so let's deal with AB over DB. So we'll use that one. All right, AB over DB equals, and then just pick out one of the other ones. I don't care. I'm going to go AC over DE. Okay. Is that all right? Now, I'm going to rename these. Okay, A, B, I'm just going to write as hypotenuse, so capital H, and I'll use a subscript of blue. So hypotenuse is a blue, seg or blue triangle, right? Is D, B, the hypotenuse of the red? That should equate then... AC is, if I'm thinking about angle right here, this is the angle that we're interested in. That's the alpha uh, that is being defined as 30. Um, so that is, so AC would be what in comparison to that angle's location? The opposite. So we're going to say opposite of blue over opposite of red, because then DE would be that segment, right? Right there. Is okay? All right, so that doesn't really lead me to anything. It just maybe gives me a better visual of the, the components that we're talking about and the, the link that's going to be made here in a moment. We know that regardless of proportions, if I have, so like, like one half equals, you guys agree it equals three six. One of the things that we're allowed to do with proportions is interchange the means. Because what, what is the main algebraic process that we do with proportions. We cross multiply, right? By definition, we say the product of the extremes is equal to the product of the mean. Okay? Meaning that I can take 3 and 2 and multiply them together. I take 1 and 6 and multiply them together, right? Does it matter the order that I multiply 3 and 2? No. So what we say, and this is just the general thing, is that we, we can interchange the means. Okay? So I can rewrite that as 1 third equals 2 six. It, they're different individual fractions, right? I no longer have one-half as a ratio. I have one-third. I no longer have three-sixths. I have two-sixths. Those are different quantities, correct? But do I still generate a proportion there that is true? One-third is still the same thing as two-sixths, right? So you're allowed to interchange those means. Now, some people say, well, I should be allowed to interchange the, the extremes as well. And you are, but we don't need to. We don't need to have that argument because... If I have one half equals three six, is that the same thing saying three six equals one half? 
If I interchange those means, do I get three halves equals, um, I'm sorry, do I get three over one equals six over two? Does that make sense? Is that still true? What would I, if I interchange those means in this position, wouldn't that have been the same as up here saying I, I interchanged my extremes? Okay. Uh, we just kind of use the symmetric property instead to, to flip the original proportion and then say, let's just stick with interchanging the mean. So that's usually what we say. You can interchange the extremes, uh, but we generally just say that the, the rule is interchange your mean. Okay. We're allowed to do that. Okay. So if I'm allowed to do that, I should be able to come down here and take that thing right there and that thing. Oh, I want those to be. I want those to be separate, so give me one second. Opposite red. So I should be able to take, so I've got my means here. I should be able to take that one and that one and interchange them, right? Now look what that did. Initially, I'm comparing two segments from two separate triangles, right? Through that division. When I interchange them, now I'm comparing two segments inside the same triangle here. Does that make sense, everybody? Two segments inside the same triangle. That's what I want. That, that's nice. Another thing that we're allowed to do with proportions, if that's my proportion, can I take the reciprocal of the first ratio, equate that to the reciprocal of the second ratio, do I still get a true statement? So let's do that. Again, that turned out to be a pain in the butt. So let's see here. I have hypotenuse of blue. Let's take those two, interchange them. And let's like these two, interchange them. Just take my reciprocals. So now I get the opposite of the blue divided by the hypotenuse of the blue. Not the right triangle, correct? The blue one's the right triangle. What's opposite divided by hypotenuse in a right triangle? It's sine, right? Look at the red one. It says opposite of red one divided by hypotenuse of red one. What's opposite divided by hypotenuse in a right triangle? Sine. Do both of those opposites and hypotenuses both reference off the exact same alpha down here. So what we're saying then is that the sign of my alpha here, regardless of the triangle, the sign of 30 degrees, when alpha is 30, is always going to be the same regardless of how big the triangle is, the red one compared to the blue one. Does that make sense? Okay. So you're always going to, that's why, you know, if I give somebody a triangle with, a 30 degree angle in it, uh, and they have a hypotenuse of four, and then somebody else has a 30 degree angle with a triangle that's hypotenuse of 24, you should both still be able to use the one half ratio with sine to be able to find some side lengths. Does that make sense? Okay. Even though your two triangles are different because they should still be in proportion to one another. Um, ultimately, right now, the way I've got this set up, if I were to take just clean this up real quick. Go to the algebra part of this. Let's see here. Are there any numbers in here? Yeah. Okay. Let's take uh, AC's length. So let's figure out what AC is. Ah, it might be easier to do it this way. Distance AC, there's distance uh, B to D, there's distance AC, and distance DE. All right. Let's just take the two pieces of information from the blue triangle. If I take um, AC, its length, and divide it by BA's length, we get that number right there, 0.5, right? Do I get the same thing when I take DE, which is the opposite side over here in the red triangle, divided by BD, 
which is the hypotenuse of the red triangle, do I still get 0.5? Now, what I want you to see is that does it really matter what that red triangle is? No, at 0.5, this is the 0.5 here that I'm talking about. That's the 0.5 out of the red triangle. It is always, no matter where that goes, because the red one and the blue one are always going to be similar by AA. Therefore, the sides are always going to be in a proportion. That is a one to two relationship. Is that okay there, everybody? Okay. Um, then allowing me to figure out distances when I only know one side length of that triangle and I know it incorporates a 30-degree angle. Now, the same thing happens. It doesn't have to be a 30-degree angle. It could be any angle measurement that we want. So we can have a 45-degree angle. We still get rate. Uh, relationships are the same. Now, here the relationship is um, radical 2 over 2, okay? Um, but it's still consistent. Those, those two triangles are still similar. Is that all right? That's why no matter what picture or what problem I'm dealing with, every time I type in my calculator, sign of 30 degrees, it sets back one half, okay, because of that similarity. The, now, eventually we'll talk about where the calculator gets that one half. The calculator is not programmed with these triangles in it. Does that make sense? Um, you know, if I type in sine of 45 degrees, it gives me radical 2 or 2 or 0 0.707 back of the decimal. Where is that coming from? It's not coming from the fact that they have taken the infinite number of triangles and programmed them in there somewhere to when you type in that number or that angle measurement, it spits something back, right? Does that make sense? Uh, your calculator is programmed with a function that you provide the input and it gives you the output back, uh, which is um, obviously much easier to... Um, to code uh, because of the infinite number of things that I could potentially put in. Okay. Um, all right. Does that make sense, everybody? I think that's a, you know, we, I, I attempt to talk about that in geometry, uh, but you guys kind of sit and think about yourself now compared to the way you were two years ago. You're a little bit more mature now, right? A little bit more developed uh, mathematically and mentally. Uh, I think it makes more sense now than maybe it did when, uh, when you were in geometry. All right, so let's uh, get to talking about like, why. Where, where is this useful? And what are we going to do with this unit circle that we talked about on, on Friday? We're going to get to this. These are the definition of the trigonometric functions. And we talked about these a little bit in Chapter 5. Uh, but now talking about them in Chapter 6, I think will make a little bit more sense to us. Okay? In Chapter Five, what we did is that we talked about a triangle or a, yeah, let's do a triangle, where I had, let's say, a segment here of three, a segment of four, and I got that triangle right there, correct? That make sense? Now, that triangle is going to be inside a circle, and that circle is going to be that circle there, okay, a radius of five. So that tells me that's a three, four, five triangle, right? Okay. Now, what we did in Chapter 5 and maybe what, some stuff that we've done in um, geometry is that if I give you this angle here to be theta, and this is three, this is four, this is 5. I asked you, what is the sine of theta? And you told me it was what? 4 or 5. Okay? If I asked you to find cosine of theta, you told me it was 3 over 5. Okay? Now, my hopes are that you're done. You're, either, you're still going to be asked what cotangent, tangent, secant, cosecant are. But my hopes are that you're done with actually using this, this triangle and this circle once you have these two things. Okay, because we talked about tangent being the same as sine divided by cosine, right? And we'll, we'll show why that is the case here in a little bit. Um, but sine over cosine is just going to be, what, four-fifths over three-fifths, ends up being four-thirds. And then I'll just do one of these. Well, let's say cosecant. Cosecant of theta would be the reciprocal of what? Fine. So you say it's five fourths. 
no longer using the triangle, right? Once I have these two defined values, I use those in their relationships with one another to come up with cosecant, secant, cotangent, and tangent. That's awesome. That's great. And what we are doing is ultimately saying, if I put this in the, in the coordinate plane, isn't this a y value? Isn't this an x value? And because of the Pythagorean theorem, your r value will always be a positive number, right? Okay. Maybe you're more comfortable saying this is the adjacent side, and this is the opposite side, and this is the hypotenuse, and you run through and you use Sokotoa, right? Use that mnemonic device, okay? Perfectly fine. That's, that's acceptable. It's just at this point in trig and in our algebra skills, we're going to take opposite and redefine it as Y, adjacent and redefine it as X, and so forth. Why do we do that? Because now sine of theta Instead of being opposite over hypotenuse, we can just say it's y over r, correct? Cosine is now x over r, tangent, I think about 4 over 3, it just be y over x, right? And I can do the same thing, cosecant. Cosecant is now going to be r over y. Does that make sense, everybody? Now, why do I want to write it that way in the unit circle? Why is it convenient in the unit circle? Here, R is 5 every single time, right? Look at these nasty things like 4 fifths, 3 fifths, that kind of thing. What is R in the unit circle? It's 1. So all those denominators of R, or the numerators of R, all turn into 1, right? So in the unit circle, when I'm looking at, the triangle that's incorporated here in this unit circle, the R value here is no longer 5, but 1. So sine of theta, go back to this, the sine of theta, or T here, remembering that T is the same, the arc length, but it's the same value as theta. It's just the Y value, because it's Y divided by R, but R is 1, right? So for my terminal points on my unit circle, Kind of make it analogous to what we did over here. Still there. This point right here is three comma four, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I'm in this triangle, I if I want to find sine and cosine, I have to still divide the sine and cosine by my hypotenuse, right? with a 3 and a 4 by my hypotenuse of 5. But if I'm in the unit circle, do I have to do that? In this big circle, the hypotenuse is 5, right? In the small circle, the hypotenuse is 1, correct? Do I ever, isn't it trivial to divide by 1? So I don't need to do that. So when I'm on the unit circle, and I've got an angle of 30 degrees here, and that ordered pair right there for 30 degrees is root 3 over 2 comma 1 half, that, that ordered pair tells me exactly what sine and cosine are because I don't need to divide by my hypotenuse because it's just 1. It's trivial. Okay? So when they ask me what is the sine of 30 degrees, it's what coordinate up there? That's 1 half. That's the y coordinate, right? So sine of your angle or sine of your T value on the unit circle is just the Y coordinate of the ordered pair. Cosine is the X coordinate. Does that make sense? Now, I don't know if this is done on purpose, and I don't think it is because of how, like if you did some like historical research on what sine and cosine, where those words come from, sine has um, been transferred over to like, an, from like three different languages, and through the transferring of languages, there was, um, you, know, you, you get, you know, some, some languages don't have words for the same thing, right? So there, there's uh, mistranslation sometimes. Uh, and sign, the way we, S-I-N-E right now, is actually referring to the sinuses in your head. Uh, and that doesn't really make, because it was just a translation issue. Uh, and it just stuck. Okay, so it's just something we've kept. Uh, so I don't think this has been done on purpose, but 
my X coordinate and my Y coordinate, are those alphabetical? Is cosine and sine around that way, are they alphabetical? So is it easy to see now that X and C match up, Y and S match up? Remember doing that with domain and ranges? Okay, same thing happens with, with sine and cosine. Um, and, and, and the reason I show that is because a lot of people understand, they know that their sine and cosine should come from that order pair, but they mess them up all the time, okay, because they get them backwards. So make sure that you know that they're alphabetical. Um, when we continue to look at these, then sine, like I said, sine is equal to your y value. It's still opposite divided by hypotenuse. Your hypotenuse is just r, uh, or r, which is 1. Uh, cosine is adjacent divided by hypotenuse, uh, uh, r again being 1, so that's why we just get x. Tangent is y over x. Okay? Think about why tangent is y over x. If I were to take the unit circle here, this is my x, this is the y, we have just defined that opposite divided by adjacent is y over x, right? But what was y if we're in the unit circle? What did we say y was? What was y equal to? The sine. What was x equal to? Cosine. So do you see why then sometimes we just say tangent is sine divided by cosine? It's because it's the y value divided by the x value. Okay. Um, so that's something to think about. Now, the only thing is that x cannot be 0. I cannot divide by 0 uh, for uh, the tangent. So take your calculator out real quick. I'm just going to do one of these. Let's just put our mode into up. Oh, you're fine. Oh, Yeah. I might make you move it to the jump so that it breaks me. <laughs> we'll probably try to get that in a bit. Maybe. We'll do it together. Okay. All right, so if, I, if I'm dealing with, um, let's just do it in degrees, so make sure your mode's in degrees. Let's go 30 degrees. So if I have a, a, an angle here of 30 degrees, and, and I want to figure out what tangent of 30 is. And I want an exact value. Okay, tangent of 30, I want an exact value. Now you might think, if I type down my calculator, tangent of 30, but that gives you like 10 decimal places. If we were to actually take your calculator and type in tangent of 30, the way your calculator is generating that value, I would say that if we go out to like 10,000 decimal places, it's going to be off in what uh, the exact value actually is. Okay, now is that impactful? Probably not for the things that we're going to use it for. Um, but I want an exact value. I don't want what my calculator gives me. Okay? So this is what we do. We take our unit circle. What do we know on our unit circle? What is sine of 30 on our unit circle? It's one half. What is cosine of 30 on our unit circle? Radical 3 or 2. If I take sine divided by cosine, or this is my y value divided by my x value, right? If I take one half divided by root 3 over 2, it gives me 1 over root 3. If I rationalize that, it just gives me that. So let's see if that equates. Let's see, type in tangent of 30 and see what it gives you. It should be like 0.577, I think. And then type in radical 3 over 3. It should give you the same 0.577 number, right? Okay. So that's kind of the idea of what the unit circle is allowing us to do. Once, because we know the unit circle for these multiples of 30, multiples of 45 around it, we know the ordered pairs, we should be able to quickly generate without our calculator with a sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cotangent, cosecant, r, uh, for that angle measurement. All right? Now, let's talk about one that, so I always, I always draw this little triangle, whether you put the, so there is the circle in here, so you got your unit circle in there, where this thing here being one. Uh, whether you draw a circle or not, I don't really care, but if I'm working on, Let's say tangent of 90. Type in tangent of 90 on your calculator and tell me what it says. It's an error, right? It's a domain error, doesn't it? Okay. Um, so here's the idea. Now, this is, this is kind of a, a weird thing to do. Let, let me see if I can, because it's kind of hard to draw. 
last period. Let's see if I can do it this way. All right, so as I move this, that triangle is going to change, right? That makes sense, everybody? Well, at some stage, at some stage, that triangle is going to be very, very, very narrow, right? Now, let's go to, I had 88.2. Okay, that triangle at 90, let's look at it at 89.99. That's still a triangle. If I zoom in on here, you're still going to have a very, very, very thin sliver of a triangle. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, when I do that, though, let's talk about the lengths of the sides of that triangle. Okay. This, this distance here, this x distance that is B to C, what would that distance be when I have that triangle? What's that B to C getting to when I get closer and closer to 90? Closer and closer to zero. What are that distance and that distance doing as, this, this one's always going to be one, right? This one, as I move around that unit circle, the opposite side continues to get closer and closer to what? One. And they're going to be the same when I'm at 90, aren't they? They're both one. So here's the idea. Now, it's a pain in the butt to draw it this way. But let's say that I'm looking at just like an 80-degree angle. I'm going to say that I'm just going to draw this picture, but the idea is that that point right there is actually right there. So this x distance, we would say, would be zero, right? This y distance would be one, and our hypotenuse would be one if we had a triangle that was right here. It, it ultimately becomes a collapsed triangle. Does that make sense? We can still use the triangle concept to help us determine why tangent of 90 is undefined. Because if I got these values on my triangle, I type in ta tangent of 90 degrees or pi over 2 in radians, it's opposite, or y, divided by x. But what's x? Zero. That's why we get an undefined back. Okay? You're going to get the same thing at 180, aren't you? Okay. If I go to, or not, sorry, not, not the same thing. At 180, you're going to get zero. At three, seven, or sorry, 270, 270, you're going to get the same thing back. Um, if I go to 180, let's look at 180. Okay. What distance now is approaching zero? And that little sliver of a triangle, wouldn't this AC opposite side become zero? That would be one. The hypotenuse is one. Now, the adjacent side would be negative 1. But if I ask for the tangent of 180, okay, so this angle right here, the opposite side would be 0. The adjacent side would be negative 1. What's 0 divided by negative 1? 0. So if you type in tangent of 180, that's why you get 0 back. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. I think those are the hard ones to see because essentially when I'm at 180 degrees or I'm at 90 degrees, I have a collapsed triangle, right? I don't really have a triangle there. Uh, but we still evaluate um, to find zero or undefined. Um, okay. So that, that idea that I cannot divide by zero uh, for the tangent uh, happens at 90 degrees and 270 degrees. Uh, for the cosecant, I cannot let y be zero. Okay. So for the cosecant, I'm going to be undefined at zero degrees and 180 degrees. Does that make sense? That's where your y values are zero. Uh, for the secant, I have one divided by x. That's the reciprocal of cosine. Again, there, I can't uh, have a secant defined at pi over 2 or 90 degrees and 270 degrees. And then cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so uh, y then cannot be zero there. Is that okay? So what what is the purpose of the unit circle? Then? So the unit circle, hopefully... We, we've started to kind of work on that and, and try to uh, memorize that. that. That quiz will be coming up soon. Um, if I were to take sine of t, I'm not sine, I'll just say 
they tell me my terminal distance, or even theta, because at some point we're going to just start talking about theta and not so much t, is pi over 3. So I've got my unit circle. Pi over 3 is in the first quadrant, right? Pi over 3 should be about right there. It's analogous to 60 degrees. That ordered pair is 1 half radical 3 over 2, right? And what that tells me, in that right triangle right there, this distance is my adjacent side. It's 1 half. That distance is my opposite side. It's root 3 over 2. This distance here is my radius of 1, right? So then, if I take my x divided by my radius and my y divided by my radius, I'm going to get whatever that x distance and that y distance is, right? And those are going to be identical to my cosine and sine. So when they ask you to find the six trig ratios, I'm going to write them down. I'm going to go cosine of pi over 3. I'm going to go sine of pi over 3. I usually just write all six of them down right away. What's the reciprocal of cosine? Which one goes with cosine? Secant. I'll say secant of pi over 3. That means this has got to be cosecant, right? The way I remember that is with the reciprocals, the, the C's never go together or the S's never go together. Um, I think that through, through trig, there's a lot of those little kind of, I don't know, learning devices or associations that you have to kind of make or that you can make to help you remember what kind of pairs together and what doesn't pair together. Um, so looking at these then, let's just do, let's, let's evaluate them. Okay? Maybe. There we go. All right, so when they want the cosine of pi over 3, that is what coordinate from this point? Or this is x and y, right? And cosine up here in our blue diagram said cosine was x, right? It's the adjacent. If I just look at the picture, if I forget that, look at this picture. It's adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Well, it's one half divided by one, right? Equivalent to just that order or that coordinate of that order pair. So cosine of pi over three is one half. What's the sine of pi over three? Yeah, it's the y value, right? So cosine is your x, sine is your y. Now my hopes are is that you're done using the unit circle. Once you have that information, I'm done because I now know the relationships stuck between these things. Okay, tangent. Apologize for that. The tangent is sine divided by cosine, right? Do you have sine? Yeah, three, three or two. Do you have cosine? One half, right? So if I divide those out, I get just root three, right? And you would find out that if you took your calculator, put it in radian mode, typed in tangent of pi over three, it's going to spit back. 1.707 or something like that, okay, um, which is the exact same thing as radical 3. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, secant, you told me secant was the reciprocal of cosine. Mm -hmm. So what's the reciprocal of 1 half? 2. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So I have 2 over root 3, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we like to rationalize that, so I'm going to write it as 2 radical 3 over 3. And then cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which would be 1 over root 3, which we like to rationalize as root 3 over 3. Does that kind of make sense? And those are exact values of what your calculator would give you back if you type those things in your, um, your TIA3 or your TIA4. The only thing with your TIA3 or TIA4, I can't type in, there's not a secant function on those because TI knows that there's that relationship between sine and secant, or sorry, sine and cosecant, cosine and secant, right? And they're reciprocal. So if I want to find on my calculator what the secant of pi over 3 is, the way I have to type that in is 1 over cosine of pi over 3. If you type that in, 
hit enter, it'll give you two back. Okay. Um, now, the reason I, I want to do this one here on the right is pi over 2 one. This is on the unit circle. Pi over 2 is how many degrees? So now I guess to 90 degrees, right? So we're right there, correct? What's that ordered pair for that point right there? Zero, 1. So when I go find the sine of pi over 2, the cosine of pi over 2, and the tangent of pi over 2. What are those things? What's the sine of pi over 2? 1. What's the cosine? 0. Tangent is sine divided by cosine, right? What's 1 divided by 0? Undefined. So the tangent is undefined. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because the next thing we're going to do is use reciprocals, right? Well, using reciprocals maybe is a little bit abstract here with uh, some of these. Cosecant isn't too bad. Cosecant of pi over 2. What's the reciprocal of cosecant? What should that one match up to, sine, cosine, or tangent? Should go to sine, right? So those two are uh, reciprocals. One. So what's reciprocal 1? 1. Okay. Now, cosine, think about this. This is where people struggle. Cosine, or not cosine. Uh, I apologize, secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine, okay? If I take cosine of pi over 2 equals 0, writing 0 as a rational number, writing as a fraction, would be like 0 over b, where b can be any number, right? 0 over 1, is that still 0? 0 over 2, is that still 0? 0 over 2 million, is that still 0? Yeah, okay? So... I don't necessarily know what my denominator is there. The best thing to do would be let it be 1, right? That makes sense? The easiest thing to do. If I have 0 over 1, what's that reciprocal? 1 over 0. And what's that mean then? Undefined. Okay? So the secant is undefined there. It's not as easy to see, I think, when we deal with just the reciprocals. You know, the first one with pi over 3 where everything was defined, uh, reciprocal is pretty easy, but when I have a zero and I want to find its reciprocal, I think that analysis is, is helpful. Now, cotangent of pi over two, think about this. Undefined means it's not a number, right? It doesn't exist. It does, it's not something I can put my hands on and say, it is this value. It does not, it's not defined. It's not there. Does that make sense? Okay. So if it's not there, if it's not something that I, it's not something I can, Attach a number to or a value to, can I even take it and flip it and find it's reciprocal? No. Okay. But how did I generate the fact that it was undefined? It was this right here. I have sine over cosine. So if it's sine over cosine, it was 1 over 0. That reciprocal is 0 over 1. What's 0 over 1? 0. Okay. So you can then... Uh, come up with all six trig ratios, even at places where you're going to have undefined uh, relationships. Okay? Does that make sense? That's the purpose of the unit circle, for us to be able to generate those six trig ratios on the instant, very quickly. Okay? Um, now, obviously, the, the unit circle, if you wanted to, you could learn a unit circle to have all six of those and memorize all six of those. When, when I was in high school, uh, we, we did a similar approach to Chapter 5 and Chapter 6, in, in which Chapter 5 we did the triangle approach, and they gave us a chart. And on the chart, they had our angle measurements from 0 to 360. And then across the top of the chart, it had sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Okay, so we had six things across there, and we had like 17 angles in the left-hand column, and then that filled the chart in. Does that make sense? Okay, and we had to memorize that chart so we could use it. And that is the stupidest thing ever. It's a waste of time because when we get to the unit circle, that chart is taken care of with the first quadrant. Does that make sense? And, and our understanding of these relationships. Um, so that's kind of its purpose, is to be able to generate these values quickly for our calculation. 6-2 um, is available. Not going to be due tomorrow. Uh, I got it set off for Thursday. It's not going to be due Thursday either. Um, I, I, I would anticipate it's not being here tomorrow. Okay, um, just because obviously we weren't because we weren't here yesterday. 
and I think it's going to be a little bit I mean, we're not more snow. Here, yeah, I mean, juniors will be here taking the – and we're not going to be in class, so I good point. So, regardless, we're not being – I don't know if I have two out of the way, we'll be in class. So, <laughs> crazy. Uh, yeah, so not going to be – it's set for Thursday right now. It might even expire on Thursday, depending on when I get back into it and change it, but it's not due Thursday, all right? If we're not here tomorrow, uh, I, I'm going to send out a, a short 20, 25-minute video uh, to just pick up with some extra stuff out of this slide, um, which would have then assist you in uh, the 6-2 assignment as well. Okay, so the 6-2 assignment, yesterday's videos, tomorrow's videos, those would be our, kind of our blizzard bag assignments uh, to just make sure we get done um, within the next couple days. Send us a video if we're just here for ACT anyway. No. No, no. If, 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 we are, if we are canceled, that's, that's the only time I'll send it out. I like your jar of crunchy peanut butter. Not so much. You're like the only other person that likes crunchy peanut butter other than me. I love it. Creamy peanut butter is gross. Pardon the interruption. This is just a reminder that there is a gatekeeper meeting today in the auditorium during Wildcat time. So, again, uh, right now in the auditorium is a gatekeeper meeting.